Welcome to our conference on the how of teaching and learning with Apple devices in the classroom. We're all very used to caring about why we should be using technology in the classroom, but not very much about how to integrate it into teaching and learning. I'm not saying that we have the sort of limit for technology integration, but as every school has a different um, set of challenges, but what we have had is the most incredible success with our project, and we want to share that with you today. As an Apple IT school, we are privileged to have been identified as, as a school that shows best practice using Apple technologies in teaching and learning. And as this is the first Apple Lighthouse conference, we are called EverHealth. We want you to be completely open with us about your experiences. Our goal today is to give you the opportunity to experience our successes and take as many ideas away with you that will contribute to the success of a similar project you may be planning or running at your school. And hopefully you will share your successes with us. Our journey has been a long one, and with it there is a history and many lessons learned. The Apple One to One team is hoping to share this with you during the day or in the Q&A sessions. However, there is one point I would like to make before we start. And that is that we have forged strong relationships with Alan Goldberg from DigiK, Joe Moretti, an Apple mentor from the United Kingdom, Kevin Sherman, who was previously with UCT school, the UCT Schools Development Unit and now a full-time employee of the college, and the core group. All of them have traveled this road with us. They are not just suppliers of hardware or knowledge, they have become partners and education specialists who have proven to be invaluable to our project. So I encourage you to speak to them. Just to give you a bit of perspective about our school. We're a private independent school and we cater for learners from 12 months old to matric. We have approximately 1,200 learners in our school. In July 2010, we began, we began our Apple One to One initiative and we currently have 559 MacBooks MacBooks in the college from grades 5 to grade 12. 80% uh, of the learners on the project have their own device. And those who do not use a, uh, those who do not have a device use a school loan device. We have loan banks uh, of 12 each. In January 2012, we extended our Apple One to One initiative to include iPads from grades 1 to 4 and we currently have 341 iPads in the school. 85% of the learners on the project have their own device. Those who don't also use um, our mobile bank, we have 12 in each bank. In January 2013, our secondary faculty will extend to use iPads as well as MacBooks, and as you can see, the uptake has been incredible. 341 iPads, 85% in 89 months. Okay, the event schedule. All of you have received this little piece of paper, and it's, a very, it's going to be a very busy day, because what we want you to do is to experience what is happening in the classroom, with classroom observations, uh, and we, we also want you to have experience a lesson as a learner uh, by, uh, that our teachers are going to present to you. So first and most important thing is your name tags. They have colors. Okay, so you're all aware of those colours. Those colours will put you into particular groups. And at the end of this keynote, I'm going to ask those particular colours to follow a particular person to their sessions. All right. Uh, lunch is at Sand on campus. So did anybody not bring their own transport? <coughs> did everybody come in their own transport? Okay. Good. Uh, on the back, <laughs> there is a map which shows you how to get from here, which is our preparatory campus, to Sandow, which is our secondary faculty. Did you all park in the Wood Drive um, parking? Great. What you do is when you come out of the Wood Drive parking, you go right. So you go straight up to the end of Wood Drive. You'll see the big checkers on your left. There's a big building on the right that's parked in Sandow. So you turn down College Avenue, and you go into security, and security will direct you to the pavilion where lunch will be served. Okay, so everybody happy with that? So, out the parking, right all the way down to the bottom, the 
the road stops and checkers on you. <coughs> right to get there's there's a map for that. Um, after that, you'll have Keynote Two, which is uh, the secondary by task Keynote. Uh, then the uh, workshop session two and a Q and A with that for one to one team. Please, uh, I think everyone took an iPad. Did they? Great. Because those, sorry, did you? Because you have apps on that that you're going to be using in the workshops. Uh, you must hand those iPads back in. <laughs> <laughs> at the mind of all of the secondary faculty, all right? And I uh, think you've been scanned and photographed. <laughs> yeah. uh, great. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Kevin Sherman, who's our head of curriculum and learning. Okay, good morning. Fia Mora. Bolaveni. Okay, um, forgive me, I'm going to talk a little bit fast, and I, and I come with this accent, and I, you'll have to forgive me for that too, because it's sort of stuck. Um, but I'm going to race through my talk, because you have more important things to see and, and more interesting people to hear from, especially these guys um, today. Uh, I'm assuming you're here today because you're either made a significant investment in Apple technology, or you're considering making that investment. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is what are some of the questions you might want to be asking yourselves. Often when you talk to teachers about why they like technology, they say, oh, well, the children just love these devices. And I refer to that as the novelty effect. Um, and unfortunately, it does wear off after a while. Um, we get bored with devices. We want something new. And there's nothing wrong with, with the motivation that comes with technology. I think that's a great thing. But as professional educators, we have to avoid getting trapped into that um, consumer electronics buzz uh, and jumping on to the next latest thing. So I'm sort of asking you to consider being thoughtful in your approach. And obviously you're doing that because you wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, what I'm assuming also is that you want to have an impact on learning. That you're not just going for the device because it's a gimmick. Parklands has made a significant investment in technology, but they've also invested in a process that's led to this to its successful implementation, um, and you'll witness that today. I want to share some of the critical questions that led to that success rather than telling you what they did, because what they did isn't going to work for your context. Every context is unique. Um, so we're going to instead focus on a few questions you might want to be asking. Um, before you spend a lot of money on a vacation, you usually give some thought to the destination, right? Uh, you might want a beach holiday, some of you, some of you might need it. Um, you might want a little culture, fine dining uh, in a city, but before you go, you decide what your goal is. And the same should be true for technology. You have to ask that question. Um, and there are different ways of framing that question. You have to ask the question, what are the school's goals for technology? And you also have to ask, what are some of the goals that teachers might have for instructional technology? And do those goals support learning? Can they articulate those goals? Everyone has to know where they're headed. Um, sometimes goals like destinations can be a little bit fuzzy. So I think it's important to try to um, craft a goal. And as you do that, because we're in education, you might think about, what is the educational need? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? What's the gap in learning that's taking place? How can instructional technology enhance learning? How can it meet these needs? And as with any trip, you want to, you're not planning for today, because today you're at work. You're planning for the future. So don't plan for what you're doing now. Plan for what you want to do with technology. And part of what you're going to see today is it may give you ideas for what you want to do. And you have to give some thought as what we're doing, what we're seeing here, work for us. And the answer may be no. So you have to give yourself some more freedom to explore. Another question to ask are, what are the correct tools for the task at hand? Now, there's an assumption that you're interested, obviously, in, in Apple, or else you wouldn't be here. Um, I've been using Apple products since I started teaching in 1985, so I'm a little biased. Um, but I do think that it's the only way to go, um, and, and so I have, it, I have no problem being biased. Um, but if your car had broken down, 
you wouldn't reach for your toolkit without doing a little bit of checking under the bonnet first. It's a bonnet here. It's checking how British you people are. Um, and you certainly wouldn't use a saw uh, as your first go-to tool if you're talking about your engine. You'd analyze the problem. You'd select the best tool for the job. And in this case, what we're talking about are the apps, the software that comes with the devices. Because that's, for me, what makes the difference with an Apple product. The devices are wonderful, and there's no question about the reliability, and there's no question around, you know, is this the best hardware? I think so. Uh, but it's the apps that are essential for you to consider when you're thinking about what you want to do with the technology in the classroom. And pick the best tool for the job. So, in this case, um, you've, you've captured their interest. What do you want to do with that interest? Well, the reality is that technology is sort of changing the nature of learning. And it's changing the nature of how we understand learning. Um, in the 1990s, Howard Gardner's uh, theory of multiple intelligences was very popular when I was starting my teaching career. Um, and I'm not saying that Howard Gardner is wrong and that his approaches are wrong. Um, I, I like the idea of multiple intelligences, but in the last 10 years, neuroscience has revealed um, that there are certain parts of the brain that are responsible for certain kinds of learning. And there are three, essentially three connected types of learning, if we're looking at it from a neuroscience perspective. And there, these three types of learning are supported by different parts of the brain. So we have factual knowledge, which I think you all know what that means. Um, and that's the knowledge of what. If we look at the CAPS documents, there's our factual knowledge. It's all laid out very plainly. Um, but then there's procedural knowledge. It's how to go about doing something. And that's something that I think as educators we often neglect. Certainly the curriculum for, for a large part neglects it. Um, now you could look at science and you could look at mathematics and you see more obvious signs of procedure. But if we're talking about something like teaching writing, I don't think that procedure, the process of teaching writing, is as explicit in CAPS, for example, as it could be. But the third kind of learning that neuroscience has begun to reveal is this idea of motivational engagement. We want to understand why something is important to learn. And there's actually a place in the brain that is that's concerned with that. We learn and remember what attracts our interest, and what, our, what attracts our interest and our attention can vary. And it can vary by learner, as you know. We all hear that technology is inherently engaging, but it depends on how it's used. I think technology has the power to unlock this need for motivational engagement. And it has a way to do it that's unique to each individual learner, if we create a learning environment that allows for that. So that's another challenge for you. I want to just give you uh, not a very specific example, but a little bit of an example. How can we use the technology to inspire imagination and creativity? Well, children become more active learners when they're using technology. You've know, sort of known that. That's taken for granted. When learners use the tools that professionals use, though, they begin to see themselves in more productive professional roles. So some of them may say, you know what, I'm not just a learner anymore. I'm actually a design engineer. Or, we're not just doing this thing in the classroom, we're actually being scientists. Or, amazingly enough, they might see themselves in the role of teachers, right? You're going to see that today. You guys are good teachers. Um, so, I think teachers are good at teaching factual knowledge. And that, generally in my career, later in my career, that hasn't been my concern. It's not my concern and it's not really my interest. Uh, because I think that's what teachers are, are taught to do well. My challenge to you is to try to find ways to reinforce other kinds of knowledge that isn't as explicit in the curriculum. So you might try to answer these questions. How can technology help children learn that procedural knowledge? And how can technology help children become more active learners who have their own personal reasons for learning? Because that's how we're going to create lifelong learners. So what makes Parklands a success story? I started out today suggesting that Parklands had asked a lot of the right questions. But the single most important question after identifying their goals for technology was, what's our plan for ongoing professional development? And that's how I ended up getting involved with Parklands. Um, that's why Joe is here. That's why Alan has been involved with the school. 
Today you're going to experience the hardware as well as the apps, but you won't see the hours and hours of work that's gone on behind the scenes that teachers have put in to making this project a success. And there's been a healthy balance here between two important aspects of professional development. There's, the first aspect is how do you operate the technology? And that's an important thing. You need to get the technology in teachers' hands and they need to understand how the thing works. But often, the mistake that schools make is the training ends there. People say, oh, you know what to do, you're teachers, and they walk away. And we see this way too often. So the real challenge is to balance that need to give professional development and how to operate the device, or even the software, versus how do you actually integrate this into your teaching? So I, I beg you to remember that second aspect. Um, there's no short answer. I can't, give, I can't give it to you. I've only got 15 minutes. Um, I can't give you the answer to that. But there are lots of tools for how to explore. <coughs> I do want to share this model. It's a bit, this is a little nerdy. Um, and I've been, at the I've been at the university for three years, so you have to forgive me. Um, but I, do th I have found this very useful in my own research. Um, and it is sort of the trendy thing, you know, in, in educational research and ICT. Um, it's called the TPAC model, which has, stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. And if any of you have done your master's, you probably come across Lee Shulman's um, Pedagogical Content Knowledge. Um, Shulman was a professor at Stanford. Um, and he basically said, you know, they're, they're, teachers have an understanding of the content, they have knowledge of content, what they teach, and they have knowledge of how to teach it. So pedagogical knowledge is basically um, how do you construct a learning activity? And an example might be how do you make a presentation? How do you do lecture? Um, but it also includes knowledge of your learners. That's also part of that pedagogical knowledge. Um, and their needs. Technological knowledge is the knowledge of the devices and the software. And at its most basic, technology knowledge could be how to operate the laptop or how to make a presentation on an iPad or some other device, um, but it's also going a little deeper, like having knowledge of learners. It's having knowledge of what the technology can do, and in the field that I've been working in, we call that technologies affordances. So let me digress for just a quick moment about affordances. Affordances are what a device or the, or a piece of software can do, and it's what it can do even if we don't know that it can do it. So the object's sitting there, and it can do a lot of things even though we don't know that it can do them. The challenge in today's world is understanding a device well enough, or software, to know what it can do. Does it enable access to information? Does it allow learners to collaborate? Does it encourage their individual expression or their creativity? Um, and I promise you today, you're going to see, you're going to discover many of the affordances of Apple technology that you never dreamed of. Um, Joe Moretti, been, who's going to work with you later today, has been doing training all week here at Harvard. And, Every time he comes, I get exposed to all kinds of things that I never thought were possible. And I think what's fun for us, for those of us who are interested in technology, and one of the reasons why we're interested in technology is we do get excited by what's possible and, and, and discovering that new thing that the device can do. Um, but back to, to TPAC briefly. Um, effective development, professional development, has to look at that center area. The intersection of a teacher's knowledge of technology with her teaching strategies for pedagogy and her knowledge of the subject matter. Just as importantly, you have to consider the models of professional development. So when is it the right time to do all staff training? When do you want everyone in the same room together? How do you support one-on-one -on -one professional development within your school? Or when is it appropriate to just do small group training? What outside resources do you need? Are there communities of practice that teachers can join? Um, what online resources can, can facilitate professional development? Whenever I want to know how to do something, I often just go to YouTube. And the, the example I, I often give is my last job at UCT. My boss would call me up. He's the director of the unit. Say, hey, can you show me how to do blah, blah, blah? And of course, I'm the ICT education specialist. I'm supposed to know how to do blah, blah, blah. Um, and I say, ah, I'm in the middle of something, John. I'll be there in about 10 minutes. <laughs> But if you Google it, okay, watch the tutorial, oh, okay, that's how you get it. Anyway, I run down. I show them how to do it. Um, and and we, there's a word for that. There's a term for that in the field, and it's called just-in-time learning. And I, and, I, and I think we don't give enough 
credence and credibility to that kind of learning um, in professional development contexts. And it is important to think about how you actually provide for just-in-time learning for teachers so that they get what they need when they actually need it. This is why, and, and Richard's going to hate me for saying this, so I'm going off screen now. Um, I'm not a fan of ICDL. Because ICDL gives you way more than you would ever need. Okay, I'm a big fan of just-in-time learning because that's what teachers actually need. Um, final thought, and I'm going to veer a little bit away from education for a moment. <coughs> Using ICT in the classroom is a mix of art and science. I think of teachers as being craftspeople at our best. Um, using technology is a little bit like alchemy. Although I've been suggesting that you take a very considered, thoughtful approach to technology, we all know that the most important moments in teaching happen when there's a little bit of magic. When we enter that place where creativity meets intellect. And I want to leave you with an example of this magic that's not taken from education, but actually comes from a very human way in which art collided with science. Um, and it was a, it's from a podcast that I heard uh, a couple weeks ago. It's also a nice example of how easy it is to pull different media together, um, which I was doing last night rather late, I will confess. Um, Le Leonor Carabella is an artist, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008. And I want to play a short clip of her speaking about her cancer. I realized a year later, after I went through the whole cancer management, that I, I had no idea what they were talking about. I hadn't seen this tumor, I, I, I knew it wanted to kill me, but I didn't really understand what it meant. Now, Leonor is an artist. She needs to process things visually. So she asked the radiologist to give her pictures of the MRI scans. Each scan is a different cross-section of the tumor, like a slice of cake. You know, there's thousands of slices, so I just looked at each and every one, different angles, and I kept on wanting to see it. I wanted to see it as an object. I wanted to take it basically out of the breast. I wanted to do what the surgeon did with the double mastectomy. I wanted to do it that artistically. So she and her husband created replicas of the tumors, and she's turned this into an entire art project. She also sells the, the, the products commercially. The process was that they started with an MRI scan of a tumor, and using that MRI image, they then made a 3D blueprint of the tumor. That was then fed into what's called a 3D printer, which makes a plastic model, which is in the shape of that tumor. That was then turned into a mold, and for those of you who've actually done any kind of casting, I'm leaving out a couple of steps. Um, but eventually that mold was turned into this bronze cast. This is her tumor. Um, notice those long tentacles coming out to the sides because they're going to be important for this next step. Um, the interesting part is this is where the art meets science. Her, the first voice you're going to hear in the next clip is Dr. Alexander Swister, who is spe the specialist who removed Carabella's tumor. He'd been relying on 2D, not 3D, 2D scans to determine treatment, and those scans were misleading him about the size of tumors. And I kind of thought to myself, well, wait a minute. So maybe we've been going at the treatment all wrong. So as part of an experiment, he's working with a radiologist, Michelle Drotman, to create 3D models of tumors in the computer, just like the artists. The doctors are going to decide how much radiation to give patients based on the volume of their tumors, not just the widest dimensions. Making therapeutic decisions based on three-dimensional volume measurements has just never been to my knowledge, done at all in any kind of setting of any kind of tumor, but certainly for breast cancer. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I think that's pretty cool and I'm not going to comment on it further. It's not a downer moment, is it? You're worried for cancer. Um, I think that's an amazing example of where the technology enabled the art and the science to come together for something better. And that's what the kind of alchemy that can take place in the classroom. I'm not suggesting that you leave this to chance. Um, I think you need to keep, think about the questions that I raised earlier and try to plan a thoughtful space for, for instructional technology to flourish. But then step back, allow the magic to happen. And now you're going to see some more of the alchemy that's taking place at Parkins. Yeah.
morning everyone. My name is Bianca Edwardy and I'm a grade 3 educator here at Parkins College. Sorry. <laughs> I've been asked to give you an educator's perspective on the integration of the iPad into the curriculum and how it has enhanced teaching and learning in our classrooms. In order to do that, I'd have to start at the beginning of my journey with the one-to-one -one project. At first, it was rather daunting to think that I would have to integrate the iPad into my lesson plans. I had so many questions. What if all the learners did not have their own iPads? And what happens if, or how do I fit it into my already tight schedule? These were just to name a few. The iPad was introduced to the educators in July 2011. We were given the opportunity to attend training that was directly related to the iPad. We are having, at the moment, training with Joe Moretti, who manages to blow us away every time we see him, and Kevin Sherman, who challenges the foundation phase educators to start planning and assessing using project-based teaching. It was this training that set us on course for our first project <coughs> using the iPad in everyday teaching. In the second quarter, the grade three learners started a life cycle project. They had to choose an insect, mammal or plant as their topic and use canine browser to research their topic. They were given a checklist to guide them in their research and then they began to create their own factual booklet. They used Book Creator to do this. Once this was completed, they had to work in pairs to do a short documentary which integrated both topics and then they presented it to the whole class. I'm going to show you a short extract from one of the learners' documentaries. Plant the seed in the ground. Then the seed's roots push down. A shoot grows and leaves the plant. The plant grows tall, above flowers. The flower head opens, the flower head dies, and seed falls to grow. And it starts all over again. <laughs> <coughs> The root life cycle is like this. The adult lays eggs on weeds in water, then the eggs hatch, they start to grow fins on their back, then it starts all over again. Now this is the first step of the sunflower life cycle. The first step you do with the sunflower life cycle is you throw the seed into the ground and it starts to grow a little bud. Once the bud is formed, it starts growing leaves off the side. Once the leaves are done off the side, <laughs> the grade three educators and learners thoroughly enjoyed every moment of the project. There were quite a few hiccups along the way, but these were easily resolved. The learners were enthralled, eager, and captivated. They also worked independently from the beginning right to the end of the project. A learner with weak fine motor skills thrived during this project as he had nothing to hold him back. He could use the iPad and he felt at ease using it. All in all, their projects were a huge success and the learners succeeded in surprising us with their vast capabilities. The majority of our students started the year with their own iPads, whilst those who did not have it used the school's loan iPads. At the moment, my whole class has iPads now. The parents that weren't convinced in the beginning had the opportunity to watch the learners in action and see the work that they had produced, and then they became sold on the idea. They spent a the parents spent a fun-full morning with our learners. Um, sorry, they spent a fun-full morning with our learners, and their own children taught them what to do on the iPad. At Parkins College, we offer training to the parents who feel the need for it. We now use the iPad on a daily basis in the class, whether it be to learn times tables, create information booklets, or research information. The iPad lends itself to all three learning areas, and believe it or not, even helps with the behaviour in the class. Some learners have used their own initiative and complete homework at home, and they prepare their orals on their iPad. As educators, we find ourselves looking at the curriculum in a new light, and we even enjoy coming up with new projects for the learners to do. The main question on every mind, everyone's mind when faced with using the iPad in the classroom is will it enhance teaching and learning? 
My answer to you, without a doubt, is an it makes an enormous difference. It changes the dynamic of the class as you are no longer just the teacher and they the learners. <coughs> Everyone learns from each other. One of the selling points for me is that all the learners are captivated, even learners who normally struggle to focus in class. Fortunately for us, we have had an amazing support system, which has helped to smooth the path for us. For someone who was quite sceptical in the beginning, I am now without a doubt sold on the use of the iPad in the classroom. I have two learners who would like to tell you what they have experienced in the classroom. Okay. Good morning. My name is Mavena. I would like to tell you why I like using the iPad. I, I like using the iPad because it helps us research information for orals and teaches us new things. Sometimes people from different schools come and watch us do work on the iPad, which is really exciting. I use my iPad to research information for my orals and to present my orals. I also use my iPad to learn my times tables. Here is an example of an Afrikaans oral I made in Keynotes. <coughs> This oral is about our favourite animal. <laughs> My favourite animal was a leopard. Thank you. Today I am very excited and proud to be here because I get to tell everyone about the iPads. The reason why we like our iPads are because they are really nice to play with or work on. We even use them for projects. The iPads are like a working tool because we can use an application called Book Creator to create a book. I created a cat book that is really special to me because it took me a few days and I love making it. Thank you for listening to me today. Now I'll show you a um, mobile. integrator for the senior preparatory faculty. I've had the privilege of being involved with the Apple project since July 2010 when the college introduced MacBooks into our grade 4 classes. I've taught for 19 years and I can honestly say that my classroom has been transformed. The environment, the introduction of the, the digital um, devices, honestly the environment is just one of captivation and it's amazement. <coughs> There are lots of teachers in this audience today, and as you all know, a good teacher teaches to the children's strengths. The iPad makes this an extremely easy thing to do. 
It caters for the digital generation by bridging the gap. The digital divide has grown greater and greater over the years, as you will know. And by bringing these devices into the classroom, we are allowing the learners to process information and acquire new skills in a way that is extremely comfortable for them. The age of teaching in a linear format is a thing of the past. <coughs> learners learn by doing and by being exposed to the visual and auditory information. They are actively involved in their learning, and we found that quite often the learners who are academically weaker are technologically above average. This allows them to become the teachers in the groups and work situations, leveling the playing fields and automatically boosting these learners' self-confidence. I've always wanted to be as captivating as a television set, mainly due to the amount of undivided attention the suppliers give to these children, and they devote themselves to the screen. Well, one must be careful what one wishes for. The outlet facilitates 100% engagement and 100% motivation. During a lesson where the learners are involved with an iPad, they are on task for the entire lesson. They work at their own pace. <clears throat> and the key is to design the task so that everyone has enough time to complete the essentials in order for them to feel that sense of accomplishment. At the same time, those learners that you know work much quicker and complete their tasks rapidly they can spend time adding additional features and pages to their project. The iPad device has proved to, be, to facilitate support for the weaker learners as well, and we use this frequently during our extra lesson times and within the classroom environment. <coughs> we are fortunate in the grade 4 environment that we have 85% of the children, as Richard mentioned, that own their own iPad. The other 15% have got make use of a school iPad throughout the day. So they collect it at 8 o'clock in the morning and they return it at 2.15 when they leave. Also have to return it like you have to return yours, unfortunately. <laughs> so these grade four learners have the iPad on their desks all day, every day, creating a true one-to-one -one environment in our classes. So most tasks in our classroom are integrated <coughs> and our teachers have created various digital content for the learners. The books on the screen right now are examples of three of the the digital textbooks that we have created ourselves using an, an, an app from our books author. Very relevant and um, really appealing for the learners. These books are easy to download and they become part of the child's device. Our emphasis and our key performance indicators are engagement and creativity. We aim to facilitate as much creativity as possible and we choose apps accordingly. Learners seldom play with the iPad. Rather, they use to create, invent, collaborate, and then present what they've done. It's important to note, and this is a concern that's been voiced by many an educator, that we have not replaced the pencil. I'd now like to welcome, sorry, in fact, in many instances, we have noticed a difference in the quality of the learners' work this year. Using digital media to enhance their understanding and projects to reinforce this information, coupled with the 100% engagement that we have throughout this process, has enhanced the overall quality of the work in the learner's books as well, with the pencil. I'd like to introduce three of my experts, children from my grade 4 classroom. Some of you may have had the privilege of interacting with them in the foyer this morning during the registration period. And we're going to start with Kiran, who will be sharing her thoughts on the introduction of iPads in the classroom, followed by a short snippet from her book that she created for World Book Day. Good morning. If I think back to grade three, the teacher had to write on a board and we would carry on with our work. In grade four, Ms. Hindle makes tasks and textbooks for us on her MacBook with an app called iBooks Author. Then she puts it on, our, on the Parkland's internet and we download it onto our iPad. We work on it in notability or we open it in iBooks. We have done so many projects on the, on the iPad this year. Here are some examples. Planning our stories on Simple Minds, creating our own fiction books in Book Creator, teaching someone a new concept like fractions by recording ourselves in journey. The iPad brings joy to my life and I'm sure it does to the other students too. I just don't know how I survived last year without it. <laughs> now I'll show you a book that I made World Book Day for Little Grade 2.
Thank you. I'm sure you all remember your teacher when you were back at school giving you a poem to recite for marks. Well, this year's grade fours were directed to a website where they could choose their own poem. And Giorgio took things into his digital hands and he projected himself into the poem. Getting dressed for school by Georgia Figo. Mm -hmm. I must have been to sleepy getting dressed for school today. I tried to tuck my shirt in, but I couldn't make it stay. <laughs> <laughs> I also couldn't tie my shoes, I fumbled with the laces. I snapped my scarf and now some yarn is dangling from my braces. <laughs> my socks are different colours and my pants are inside out. My sweater from my hamper left me smelling like a trout. <laughs> control my crazy hair, the hat turned out to be a pair of purple underwear. <laughs> I spilled my breakfast on my clothes and headed into school. My friends, of course, were all impressed. I'd never been so cool. <laughs> Justin will now show you briefly his project, which was a combination of our geography this quarter, food and farming. They were set the task of being the farmer, and they were required to present the following information using any app on the out there. The location of their farm, the size, what livestock they have, machinery, labor, and any challenges they might experience. They could use text, image, video, whatever they wanted in their presentation. information. 
when you first use the iPad, it is a massive step from rubbing and writing to tapping and typing. <laughs> when you turn off the iPad, it feels like you also turn off because it's like a whole different world. The iPad is one of the best things my parents have ever bought me. The other day, we did persuasive writing in English, and if I had to argue with someone about using the iPad at school, my opinion is us children pay so much more attention to school when we have iPads. Thank you. <clears throat> Highlights of 2012, well, I think the complete transformation is obvious. Uh, the Apple Leadership Tour, our children were invited to be um, at the registration um, area, just like they were this morning, over a two-day period, where they took the, the teachers, and as I noticed this morning as well, the adults were taking copious <coughs> notes. Integrating the iPad into the science fair demonstration, and Bianca touched on the parent open day where the parents spent less than time in the classroom with the learners, and so many parents left that day thinking, I want to be back at school. <laughs> and then the World Book Day where the book that Karen created, and all of them created, but we gave them a grade two child's name and something that they liked. That's all we gave them, they'd never met them before, they created a book with the child's name inside, and then they sat under the tree and all looked down and read the book to their grade two child. So what does 2013 have in store for us? We are replacing the paper dictionaries and the paper atlases with digital apps. Teachers will continue to produce digital content for the learners and eventually we hope to move towards digital textbooks in all areas. We're working on our own classroom apps, specific to our school and our classroom needs. So watch this space as our journey becomes more and more fruitful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so thanks very much for listening to us. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed when I see, see what they can do, how confident they are, um, what the device has done uh, this day for our, our learners. So what's going to happen now is we're going to move to classroom observations, or just will consist of 30 minute observation sessions, and then you'll have a Q&A session with the educators after that, going into a workshop where you'll have a learner sitting next to you, assisting you, where you actually play a learner in a lesson. 